Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live stream. So uh, today is a it's an it's an interesting choice to talk about uh, Warren Buffett and what he brings to the table, especially with uh, what he and uh, Charlie Munger have said in the past about uh, Bitcoin, the entire uh, crypto market uh, in general, about how it's rat poison squared, how it's never going to anything, and just how it's just downright off what actually is. But regardless of all those things, when there is some great information and some great knowledge to pass down, uh, I will share it, even though there's somebody who obviously hates uh, exactly what we were doing and what we're actually investing into. So what I'm talking about is there was this great little snippet today. And this is from uh, Warren Buffett. He's given his uh, speech at, at one of his shareholder meetings. And he talks about strikes and how many you should take and how you should lean into different things. And then also, in the end, it talks really about just how important it is to just hold your ground. Because you don't have to take all this, all the strikes that come at you. And I thought it was a, it was a pretty good idea, especially right now, with the altcoin season heating up. I mean, exponentially. You cannot, you cannot swing a dead cat without hitting a YouTube video about an altcoin going to 100x. And I think it's going to get even worse as time goes on. So I want you to put this in perspective from somebody who absolutely hates what you're investing into. So just take a listen to this. It's about a minute 43. It's going to make a lot of sense. Ted Williams wrote a book called The Science of Hitting. And in The Science of Hitting, he's got a diagram, shows him at the plate, and he's got the strike zone divided into 77 squares, each the size of a baseball. And he says, if I only swing at pitches in my sweet zone, which he shows there, and he has what his batting average would be, which is 400. If he had to swing at low outside pitches, but still in the, in the strike zone, his average would be 230. He said the most important thing in hitting is waiting for the right pitch. Now, he was at a disadvantage because if the count was 0-2 or 1-2 or so on, even if that ball was down where he was only going to bat 230, he had to swing at it. In investing, there's no called strikes. People can throw Microsoft at me and, you know, you, you name it, any, any stock, General Motors, uh, and I don't have to swing. And nobody's going to call me out on called strikes. I only get a strike called if I swing at a pitch and miss. So I can wait there and look at thousands of companies day after day. And only when I see something I understand and when I like the price at which it's selling, then if I swing, if I, if I hit it fine, if I miss it, 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 it it's, it's, it's a strike. But it's an enormously advantageous game. And it's a terrible mistake to think you have to have an opinion on everything. You only have to have an opinion on a few things. In fact, I've told students if when they got out of school, they got a punch card with 20 punches on it, and that's all the investment decisions they got to make in their entire life, they would get very rich because they would think very hard about each one. And you don't need 20 right decisions to get very rich. You know, four or five will probably do it over time. Ted Williams. <laughs> and that's it. And doesn't it make a lot of sense, especially like the part where he said you don't have, to have an opinion on everything. Like on this channel, I pretty much talk about the same thing over and over again to beat into people's heads. And there's some different strategies that people will call out. What about this, this coin and that coin? And I always tell the same thing. Like, well, I don't invest into it. I don't know about it. So I'm not gonna really going to comment on it. And I think it's one of those, one of those different uh, pieces that uh, people will look at this and go, ah, you know, maybe you just, you know, you need to know all these things that's going on in the crypto space and everything that's going on. You don't. You don't. I think it's, it's a misnomer for people to say that you have to know every single thing that's going on. I think you just have to do what... Um, Warren Buffett said, which is, if you understand what you're investing into and you're passionate about it and you want to take that swing, then take that swing. But it's not like you have to take a swing for every single one of there. And the last thing I will say about this before we move on is when he talked about that punch card, if you had an opportunity to invest in 20 things only in your life, and one of those things you know, could be your business, could be another business, could be investing into your friend's business, or it could be investing into some hairpin idea that you may have. Or maybe it's something that you want to get into like for real estate or for land or maybe precious metals or another type of company that, that, that deals with mining. Or maybe it's cryptos and digital assets and things like that. But if you really think about it, if you think about what's the best option for you, is it spreading everything around and do like a, a spray and pray type of strategy? Or is it just saying, you know what, I think I know what's going on here. And whatever that project may be, I, you know, I've done my research and I feel really comfortable with doing this. And I want to hold on for the long space. I think the people with the convictions like a Warren Buffett, the reason why they're so successful is that. And uh, you may notice that a lot of the people that have a lot of the wealth, they're not day trading, they're not scalping. 
They're just uh, doing their due diligence and sticking around for the long haul. And that's pretty much the secret. So anyhow, I'm interested to think about that in the comment section. And then let's talk real quick about some things that are going on in the, in the space itself. And then we'll get into a little Q and A. It's going to be a little bit quicker. So we talked about some positive things, you know, about uh, what you should actually take a look at. You need to know about these things. These are important. So as far as like with Bitcoin, uh, the things that I get as far as like with El Salvador and, and moving into Argentina and the different uh, uh, opportunities that are there, I always say the same thing. What about, you know, just basically buying things? And everybody will say the same thing. Lightning. Lightning's the answer. It's the end all be all. And it may be. Uh, but this was a, an article that made me pay attention. This was just today. Uh, Lightning developers must wake up and fix security bugs, not please the venture capitalists. This is from a Bitcoin developer. Uh, Antoine Riard left the Lightning Network in October, argues it's also at risk of becoming increasingly centralized and susceptible to single points of failure and censorship risks. Here's what's happening. And it's, a, it's pretty technical. I linked the description. You can check it out. But this is what he says. They, the developers, need to wake up, stop the sleepwalking, go to the whiteboard, design a robust and sustainable fix in hand with other developers at the base layer, preserving the long-term decentralization and openness of Lightning. Baird also claimed that many Lightning-focused firms are compromising Lightning's mission. The sad fact being most of them are working for VC-funded entities. Look, you got to pay the bills, right? But sometimes it gets a little bit too, uh, too centralized. Commercial entities with the same low time preference to the long-term detriment of end users. Centralized systems are great in the scale of efficiency. That's what we've done so far with the Internet. It's worked pretty well so far. But the problem is you have a single point of failure and lower cost of user censorship. The fundamental risks... I might want to hedge against a Bitcoiner. I'm not sure this is an interesting Lightning future. I don't wish to be associated with being in charge or accountable for the Lightning Network and the 5,300 Bitcoin exposed. There is little I can do to halt the hemorrhage without compromising the core values of censorship resistance and permissionless Lightning Network. So I know we want Lightning Network to work and, and we feel like it could be the best thing as far as like a lit layer two and then for, uh, for payments and things like that. But there is the negative side of it. But for every you know, positive, or I mean negative, there's a positive as well. And this is a rhetorical, I believe, another developer who says lightning is the best solution, but it's not good enough. We need to actually improve it. And then we've got uh, Robin Linus says, don't get me wrong, lightning is great. Always still amazed when using it. The point is that it can't scale enough. And ARC is not a competitor, but more of an add-on. Gives you all the advantages of Cashew, but without requiring trust. All we need is covenants. And then it goes on to some other stuff. And th this was interesting to me. Uh... Riard, the same guy we we're talking about, explained that Lightning hasn't seen as many attacks as Ethereum Layer 2s because Lightning users typically only store a small amount of funds in their wallets at any given time. The question, I guess, would be then, what happens when people start storing more funds and more susceptible to hacks? And this was also interesting. A total of only $194 million in Bitcoin is locked in the Lightning network. It's not that much, according to DeFi Llama. So, again... We know that uh, technology doesn't come out the gate and work perfectly every time, but we can see that there's a little bit of problems and maybe a little hiccups going on Lightning Network. Hopefully they can resolve it. We can actually use this for the payments you know, when we see mass adoption. Anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comments. And then last two is uh, pretty positive, actually. Cosmos. It looks like they want to they want to do a, a hard fork, want to do a chain split. Uh, and because of that, well, not because of that, but Adam's down 3%, but everything's down today. So I can't, I can't uh, chalk it up to that. But here's what's going on. So if you're a Cosmos holder like myself, this will affect you. Cosmos founder Jay Kwan favors splitting the blockchains into two following a decision by the community to reduce Cosmos native token. Adam's inflation at 10%. I don't know about you, but for staking rewards for Adam and Cosmos, it's huge. So uh, when they want to reduce this, I thought it was a pretty good idea because I think they were inflating things away. The hard fork dubbed Adam One could be bullish for Adam, and I'll tell you why. And Quan uh, said, let's coordinate a split following a decision by the Cosmos community to approve a proposal to reduce Adam's inflation from 14 to 10. The approval change is projected to bring down Adam's uh, staking yield from 19 to 13.4. All right. Quan states, despite our voting against the plan, 848 has ended up passing, something that isn't too surprising, but let's see what we can do. I believe that the final plan should include an integration of Atom and Atmo forward slash Atom1 so that instead of mass selling Atom and collapsing it, we allow participation from Atom. But that's what that's in the readme can be improved. Tokenomics, people take a shot. All right, whatever that is. An expert on Cosmos and head of strategy at Stride Zone, 
a potential hard fork could resolve years of community infighting. I didn't know there was that much infighting going on, but apparently it is. And bode well for Adam token holders. And this is why. This is why I thought this was a great article. A fork would be very bullish. Political tension has impeded the development, uh, most notably when the Adam 2 had vetoed in fall of 2022. Uh, Galt explains the hard fork to lead to the biggest airdrop for Adam and could result in a massive increase in trading value for both Adam and these new Adam 1 tokens. This is the same thing that happened back in 2017 when uh, Bitcoin and Bitcoin, well, when Bitcoin forked to Bitcoin Cash. I don't know if everybody remember that. But you could get a huge amount of Bitcoin Cash. It was actually very profitable to you because Bitcoin Cash went to like, uh, I want to say over a thousand bucks. And you didn't have to do anything. All you had to do is just hold one Bitcoin. So I don't know when this is going to happen. Uh, this is in the preliminary state, but uh, uh, Jay is calling the new chain uh, Adam One. Most of Adam One allocation will go to Adam Stakers, pro rata. Unclear if Liquid Adam is included, so I'll keep you updated uh, on that one. But it looks like if you're holding uh, Adam, you could be uh, susceptible or receiving a pretty nice, sweet airdrop for just holding uh, some tokens. And then lastly, macro. And macro is the big story, and it really it really drives all all markets. And when we see stories like this, it looks pretty positive. So the Fed likely to be dovish in 2024. Traders expect the Fed to cut rates by 100 basis points next year. And this is why you've probably seen. Actually, you know what? Let me see something. What has the S and P 500, S and P 50, sweet Joseph? Yeah. Five days. That's weird. Yeah. I'll be about the same. It's not too bad. But it looks like uh, the Fed's going to cut 100 basis points by next year. Uh, this will weaken the dollar and incentivize risk taking in crypto and traditional markets. But there's something that's not said in this article, and I'll get to that in a bit. So, according to ING, the US economy and the inflation rate are expected to slow next year, as if it's not doing already. Allowing the Fed to pursue a looser monetary policy, Bank of America said the tide is turning for the greenback and it can start to adjust broadly. And Bank of America states, while we still envision the U.S. performing relatively well next year vis-a-vis -vis other major economies, the prospect of an eventual economic landing and corresponding Fed easing should provide broad relief to currencies across the globe. A weaker dollar often becomes a tailwind to risk assets, including Bitcoin, blah, blah, blah. And it's true. Uh, if we take a look here. There was a chart that I put together when the Dixie, the Dixie is just, it's just how strong the dollar is against a basket of other currencies. Uh, you've got a Canadian dollar, the pound, Japanese, whatever. I always get these ones confused, but you can just see that uh, as the Dixie, as the, as the dollar, as the strength of the dollar increases, Bitcoin goes down. And we saw it in 2013. And then 2014, uh, when the Dixie went down, Bitcoin went up and it happened again. In 2016, 2018, it happened in 2020, 2022. It's the same thing over and over again. When the dollar weakens, Bitcoin goes up. So when you hear about this happening, the dollar weakened, don't be concerned if you're an American. Uh, just be concerned if you didn't buy enough Bitcoin. <laughs> and on top of that, um, as far as like the target rates for uh, the Fed, this wasn't um, this was in the books. And now you can see that uh, as far as the next meeting, which is 13 December, Everybody's expecting the, the federal funds rate, terminal rate, to stay the exact same, 525 to 550. There's only 3.2% of crazies who think they're going to raise it, but maybe. And then in January, they think it could be the same, eh, maybe a little bit more of an increase of, of raising in January. But and then in March, it looks like about a quarter of people think they're going to cut. And then in May, it looks like they think they're going to cut again. And then in June, even more so. And then July more so. So that's good news as far as the rates and cutting. It means that they did their job. But just remember, I will remind everybody, uh, every time that there is an inversion and they cut rates and they turn around, this is a this is a spread of the 10 and 3 month. Every time they do that and uh, there's an inversion, uninversion, you get, a, you get a, uh, a recession. That's what these little gray areas are. Now, true, people will say, but Rob, what about 1966? That didn't happen, and you're right. 1966 didn't happen one time. Let's see if it continues that trend or not. 
But you can see it happened in 69, it happened in 73, it happened, Jesus, a bad one. 1979, 1980, same thing over here. 89, here's a big, here's a big dumper in 2000, 2001. Small one here in uh, 06 to 07, we had a pretty large recession. And of course, during the surveys of sickness, then look at the depth of this one. This is what uh, concerns me, because the depth of the inversion is one of the things that people always look at and say, well, now that we get to this point, what happens? Use a recession. The question is soft landing, hard landing. And uh, of course, nobody really knows for sure. Uh, one, two, one thing that two analysts can always agree on. That one's a, the third one doesn't know what they're talking about. And that's it for today. So look, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. I'm going to talk about it. It's uh, time sensitive. And yeah, sorry about my voice. Uh, for some reason, it feels fine. Just for some reason, just horse-ish. Who knows? Maybe it's all the meds I'm taking. But uh, that's it for today.